My name is Jens Chapman again. Uh, this fantastic lecture with a very brief um, uh, kind of a review of subaxial C spine injuries. And no better speaker uh, to present on classifications uh, than Dr. Franz. If you extrapolate his name, it's a Franca, lingua franca. We're trying to really get to a lingua franca, a global language that all of us understand. And yes, it's alphanumeric. So, um, with the AO uh, organization, which is a global organization that now has about 30,000 spine surgeons from around the world, we've really undertaken this task, and Alex Vaccaro deserves a lot of credit for having put this together. Again, the basic thoughts are just like what, and I'm not going to repeat John's excellent points, we want to basically identify injury morphology. In the cervical spine, there's a greater emphasis on the facet joints, and obviously neurologic status is so very important in this regard. Uh, we've, again, come from a long time where we've had individually uh, uh, phrased uh, uh, um, talks, but again, all of us were raised, for instance, in the Alan Ferguson system, which had 23 subtypes, and it was just an endless torture for excellent young fellows like Dr. DiLorenzo to try to remember the various stages of uh, flexion injuries, right, Dan? You're still traumatized from that. I'm not going to ask you that. A huge breakthrough was to try to really scale injuries towards severity, which so much matters in terms of patient outcomes and the types of treatments we have. And again, this was uh, Alex Vaccaro and my mentor, Paul Anderson, who tried to basically create a grading system. And the cervical spine was divided into four areas of structural importance. And the SLICS score was the development out of that that John referenced for the thoracolumbar lumbar spine. This was reasonably well validated. It's again not a classification system, but it tries to uh, insert some form of a measure of injury severity. You've heard by now the ABCs, and again, this is something that we preach about, and I will uh, kind of tamp, uh, temper John's enthusiasm. We still have plenty of grounds uh, for discussion, just as last night's case discussion showed. You can fill an entire day's symposium with fights about the A, Bs, and Cs. So uh, for the cervical spine, I'm just going to flash through a couple of thoughts. A zeros are basically simple trivial injuries without ligament injuries. A1 injuries are simple compression fractures. A2 are coronal splits or pincer type fractures. And A3s are the true burst fractures, as you can see here. So that's the bony injury morphology of a compressive injuries. Uh, A4s are uh, burst fractures that have a sagittal split or involve both end plates, a subtle but important differentiation that we're still trying to validate and try to improve in terms of our global differentiation. So honestly, A3s and A4s and differentiating those two remains something that we're very interested in. Why is that so? In the US, we're actually pretty good at differentiating A3s and 4s. In Europe, literally everything is an A4 almost, and I'm still not sure why that is, but there are therapeutic consequences to this. The B injuries are the posterior tension band disruptions, and recognizing that is so important. And yes, we're using CTs far more. We're using MRIs, like what Dr. Arabi said so eloquently last night. The disruption of the posterior elements is so important in terms of making clear that we probably really should uh, um, uh, go towards surgery. B2s are disruptions of ligaments in the back, which means that we probably really have to operate. B1, in contrast, means there's a bony injury, and we have a chance, a chance for um, uh, non-operative care. And B3s are the extension injuries. Those are the ankylosing spondylitis type injuries, which we're seeing with increasing prevalence. C injuries are translational injuries uh, that basically fracture everything. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. In the cervical spine, we had to somehow uh, make mention of the facet joints, and so many classification systems have failed with this. We're hopeful that this will hopefully be a little bit more um, logical. Uh, one, injuries are very minimally displaced and involve less than half of the facet joint. Twos are basically more involved. Threes are floating lateral mass, such as described by Dr. Sasso and Dr. Bransford in various papers. And type fours are any form of dislocation. And if it happens on both sides, we basically put a suffix of BL on there. So we've tested these globally. And again, this is by far the leading um, system in terms of inter and intra observer reliability. We get about a 75 to 80% concurrence. So this is not perfect, but this is as good as it gets. 
The neurologic disease modifiers are so critically important, had been overlooked in the past. I'm not going to read this out, but Dr. France pointed out the importance of this, and it follows the same logic, so you don't have to remember it twice. Now, this is, again, something different for the cervical spine than from uh, the thoracolumbar spine. We had modifiers. And this is, again, I apologize, arbitrary. We had to kind of come up and condense with the four most important modifiers for the cervical spine. One was if there's a disruption posteriorly without apparent tear. That's an M1, a critical disc herniation, a huge disc, which is so prevalent in our thoughts, and as we saw in the case discussions last night, is an M2. If there's a stiffened or ankylosed spine, we gave that a three. And M4 is whenever there's a vertebral artery injury present. So it is possible that patients have several M modifiers, a critical disc herniation, ankylosing spine, and a vertebral artery injury, for instance, in one injury. At least we have a way to target all of those. Very briefly, case examples. So this is a patient with a very significant C71 disruption, a fracture dislocation, as we call it, with spinal cord injury. And we basically give this, this kind of an acronym. It's a translational injury. C has a compression fracture, T1, which is an A1, and a bilateral facet dislocation, which gives it an F4, BL, and a complete spinal cord injury, N4. Yes, it's an acronym salad, but yes, this from a methodological and statistical chance for the first time gives us a real opportunity to look at injuries comprehensively and express them in one codifiable lingua franca, the language of John France around the world. It's case two, high-speed motor vehicle accident, radiculopathy. You can see some facet injuries here. What do we call this at C5? This is an F2 injury. It involves more than 50% of the facet joint. At C6, we have an F2 injury as well. And there's neurology with an M1 injury. That means there's a posterior ligamentous disruption, such as you can see here. So this is our attempt at trying to put this in. And again, at uh, C5, we have an A4 injury. This is a burst fracture that involves both end plates and has disrupted the canal. C5-6 here, this is a B3 injury. There's a ligamentous disruption posteriorly, but the main thing is the anterior gap basically shows that this is a hyperextension type injury. And finally here, we have a C injury, a severe disruption in both planes. It's a C5 teardrop injury, and this is a simple C, so just one letter there. We will not get away from using general language such as unilateral facet injuries, bilateral facet injuries, but again, as you can see, there's always an indecision about these injuries, interspinous ligament tears. We will still use the language in our countries, burst fractures, but actually our thought is by codifying, by structuring our ABCs, we can basically for the first time put a severity-based and treatment conducive kind of a lettering system in there. So let's keep it simple with our A, Bs, and Cs. And again, hopefully this new AO system will truly usher in a new era of having a simple, single language around the country that is severity-based and is validated increasingly globally so that one day in the future, the Europeans won't upcode every injury into a far more severe thing uh, than what we in North America, for instance, think.